Welcome back for more Bio 20. So let's talk about the evidence for evolution. So here are the objectives that we're going to go through, along with what we're going to be doing today. So last time we looked at, you know, why there's scientific theory for evolution and avoiding religious conflict. We also looked at two different aspects of evolution, microevolution and macroevolution which both involve change over time that can involve multiple types of factors. Microevolution, there are more things that can happen or that can cause it simply because it's easier to manipulate genes. Macroevolution is just stepping backwards and looking at a larger picture, and that is seeing the ultimate ramifications of those microevolutionary changes. Microevolution is sometimes just referred to as either natural selection or gene flow or genetic drift while macroevolution is sometimes referred to as speciation. When we look at the evidence for evolution, it turns out we can put it into a whole bunch of categories, and perhaps the most famous set of these would be fossils. So fossils just try to be remnants of anything from the past. We normally associate this with skeletons. The catch is most things have soft bodies and they don't have skeletons, so it makes it kind of hard to find these. Also, it is worth noting that most organisms do not become fossils, and that's because the conditions to make a fossil are actually not that common. You need to have the correct environment. So if you happen to be in an area that doesn't bury you really fast and it actually allows for decay, you don't get to become a fossil. If you happen to land in an area that's particularly acidic, you don't get to become a fossil. If you happen to land in an area where you're going to be scavenged and broken apart, you're not going to become a fossil. If you turn out to have soft bodies, you're not going to become a fossil. How do we know this? Because corpses disappear if you do this. So if you had like an animal fall down and, you know, die and you wanted to have record of it, where could that happen? And wherever you couldn't get, like, the remains of a, you know, fallen animal from, you know, a decade ago to still stick around, if they don't exist in particular environments, you're definitely not going to get a fossil out of them. So fossils are particularly rare. That said, we have a lot of fossils. Some, false, some fossils are partial fossils, some are complete skeletons, or, you know, profiles of a body. It just depends. But when we look at fossils, we tend to see patterns, especially when we look at them with what we call extant species. We dealt with that word last time. So, like, the two fossils that are shown here, so the one on the right is called Ornithorhynchus, which is its um, generic name, so genus name. Then Obdurondon is the one on the left. And if you look at them, you're like, hey, these are kind of similar. The one on the right is the platypus, and the one on the left is a fossil that turns out to have, where I'm kind of highlighting it, teeth, which is kind of strange because the platypus doesn't have teeth. So this could be a relative of the platypus that had teeth. Interesting. We also could predict where we think we should find fossils or particular types of fossils, and the fact that we can make those types of predictions tells you something about how evolution works. And usually what you end up finding are what we call transitional forms, meaning we're kind of connecting dots. If you remember that speciation has a whole bunch of different speeds, either that gradual version or that rapid change, then nothing, then rapid change, then nothing. What we're looking at is we're looking at snapshots in time. And almost all snapshots are missing. But the ones that we do see still paint us a rather powerful picture. This turns out to be one of those, quote, transitional forms. Its name is Tiktaalik, which means like a uh, cold water fish. And when we look at this thing, it's built kind of like a fish and until you look at its head. <coughs> and its head screams loud amphibian. But it also has a neck which says amphibian, even though the rest of its body says it should be a fish. It was also found in an area where we could find rocks that date back to the time when we think we would have started to have the transition from fish to amphibians. And that's exactly where we found it. This actually, and you know, these things happen all the time. So here's one from a few years ago, which is arguing about this particular fossil right here, 
which is of a soft-bodied organism, so these are exceedingly rare, and we think it might be an octopus ancestor. The catch is they're arguing about some features within the fossil that, you know, I didn't understand, but they were arguing about just from this little profile, and this is all you get, and so there's nothing else. This is all you have to work off of is trying to interpret what you're seeing. We could also look at anatomy of things that currently exist, so we're comparing extant species, and again, we could see some patterns. The most famous of these patterns are the vertebrate limb patterns. So those patterns go one bone, two bones, then you get a whole bunch of bones. So this turns out to work out for like your arms. You have one bone, then there's two bones, then you have a whole bunch of bones. One bone, two bones, a whole bunch of bones. This for your arms and for your legs turns out to work that way. But same thing if you look at, you know, a dog or to a degree like a lizard. Or if you were to look at an amphibian, turns out you can kind of sort of see where that pattern is. And, but you don't really see it in fish. It kind of breaks down there, but you can start to see the pattern starting to form if you look at certain types of fishes. Those structures where we look at them like, hey, they're following these same patterns are what we call homologous patterns, meaning they're probably built the same way, although they might not work the same way. This is in contrast to what we call analogous structures, which are ones that have the same function, but how you got to that point might differ a little bit. And that's a phenomenon that we call convergence, meaning we're approaching the problem from two different starting points, and we get to similar answers. Embryology is another source, and it actually starts to play into the previous bit. And um, this is actually a little bit harder to talk about just because the terminology is so strange that most people never take courses in embryology. The embryology I know has been, you know, through reading and listening to podcasts. So I do not know a lot of embryology. But it is famously been exaggerated in one particular figure, which is this figure right here, which is a mockery of a source. So when we look at these pictures of, you know, these different types of vertebrates, you look at it and you say, wow, look how similar they look, you know, throughout, because they're like similar sizes and all that. And this, it's totally inaccurate. And biologists would tell you that it's inaccurate. So sizes are all warped. Some bits and pieces are exaggerated to make it things look the way they do. But this isn't the power of it. So saying that, oh, see, the drawing is wrong, therefore this doesn't work, that's not the point. There's a very fancy phrase called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. So the way you develop tells the story of your evolutionary past. And it turns out we have some really strange developmental patterns that make zero sense for us now but they do make sense if we talk about how, oh, mammals came from things that were kind of like reptiles, which came out of things that were amphibian-esque, which came out of things that used to be, you know, in the water as fish or fish-like, which then came from, you know, these things that had these structures that we call chordate structures. If we look at it from that lens, it's, oh, all these weird parts actually start to make some sense. So it does not require us to look alike, but the way things are built and the order in which they're built actually starts to make sense. So there's actually genes that we found called Hox genes, homeotic box genes, where we can like trade spots from different organisms and things still form correctly. Even So we could take like fly genes, put them into mice, and the mice are built perfectly fine. So we get these weird patterns that exist in embryology. The way our hearts develop actually makes zero sense until you start thinking about it through an evolutionary lens. Our brains, the way our brains develop, actually follow an evolutionary pattern. Our inner ears make zero sense as to why they're built the way they are until you look at it through an evolutionary pattern, and then it's a, oh, okay, I can see that. I, I, I see what's going on here. We also get some weird structures here, like 
for this particular, um, I don't remember what type of whale this is, but it exists in a few whales, but if you look right here, there's this weird little thing that's sticking out. Um, that's a hip. Hip and a femur. Why does this aquatic mammal, which by the way has one bone, two bones, a whole bunch of bones, have this like weird little hippie femur thing when clearly they don't have feet and legs? And that is, it's a leftover from their evolutionary past. When we look at how things are distributed around the world, or what we call biogeography, we also start to see patterns. So this is where more of that convergence starts to kick in. So again, similar adaptations or similar solutions are found in similar environments. So there's some super famous examples of this that I'll show you on the next slide. But what we also start to see is when we start to look at how we have similar looking organisms around the world, so like all these camel or camelids, so a dromedary, a bactrian camel, and then the llamas, we look at them like how, why are they spread out so all over the place? You look at them and they're actually genetically similar, so we try to explain it, and that's a, oh, well we know that there used to be a connection between Russia and North America, so maybe if they started in one spot they could travel out so we could get some explanations that way, which means, hey, species can move between the continents. But the only way that that could happen and have them move that far and have that bridge connecting is the Earth has to be kind of old. And one of the things that's unwritten about evolution is to get all the changes that we observe, you kind of need some time to do this. We also have some other patterns I'll, I'll show you on the next slide. But we also see like weird patterns in fossils, like where do we find marsupials? So those are the ones that have pouches. Well, we can find them in Australia, obviously, but we also find them in South America. And I'd say, well, how, how'd that happen? And the, clearly the answer is, well, they had to be linked at some point in time. And then there was an adaptive radiation on through. Where do we see bears? Bears are a northern phenomenon of North America, Europe, and then obviously South America is connected. That's where we see the bears. We also get, like I said, these convergences. So the thing on the right is a cactus. The one on the left, which looks like a cactus, is actually called a euphorb. They're found in northern Africa, whereas the cactus is a North American phenomenon. They're about the same latitude, but if you check out their genes, they're not really the same. So it's not like, oh, oh, so like they, they moved, and the answer is no, they didn't. They just happened to come up with the same solution in the same spot, which is interesting. You know, Darwin knew nothing of molecular biology. I mean, cells weren't, I mean, they were known at the time, but he didn't really talk about them just because we could just kind of see them. He had some really weird thoughts about genetics, but for the most part, he didn't really talk genetics. He had some strange ideas. But everything we've been talking about in this course, we start off talking cells and biomolecules, and then you know we just finished talking about some genetic stuff. All of that, everything we've done, has been molecular biology evidence of evolution. Because you know, the fact that DNA is DNA no matter where you look. That DNA to RNA or transcription happens the same way no matter where you look. That transcription to translation is the same mechanism no matter where you look. The fact that the genetic code is practically identical and we can trade, we can put our genes into bacteria and they are expressed correctly. The fact that regulation is so ubiquitous in how things happen, how we structure our genes, holy cow. The fact that you know, eukaryotic cells have the same basic parts, even though they look and function vastly different depending on where you're looking. This is all evidence of some patterns of evolution. The fact, and we didn't talk about this in class, but mitochondria and chloroplasts turn out to have their own DNA, and that DNA looks like free living bacteria that we can find today. Molecular biology was the one area that if we were to show that you know evolution and by Darwinian mechanisms were just full of it, this would have been the thing to you know slay Goliath. But it's not. It, it just didn't do it. So does it still happen today? And the answer is, of course it does. 
So again, we have to just worry about the scale in which we look. So some really simple examples of microevolution. So these are generational changes. You know, the African elephant males are losing their tusks because it's actually an advantage to not have those tusks because you're not going to get murdered. Uh, there's a fish called the tom cod, which has recently been able to survive the, tux the toxic Hudson River water around New York City, whereas things normally couldn't live in that water. These are interesting you know, changes that have been occurring. The evidence of the tusk tuskless elephants. But we also see this macroevolution. We still see speciation as well. Bed bugs actually come came from cave species, and we have city versions that uh, like do not resemble, do not mate with the cave versions. So in the span of humanity moving into cities, we have eliminate or we have caused the evolution of a new type of insect. We have photosynthetic slugs. I mean, they they're not on their own, but is this the start of like making photosynthetic animals? We, uh, great, great question. Domestication of dogs is on us, but cane toads are starting to behave far differently than they would in their natural environments. Picture of one of the photosynthetic sea slugs. So, wh why do we care? If you don't care about any of that speciation stuff, there are other reasons why we should care about any of this evolution stuff. Microbial evolution is still a huge deal. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is one of the largest killers of humans on Earth, and it is becoming increasingly antibiotic resistant because we are selecting for the ones that can't be killed by antibiotics. How do we do that? By overprescribing antibiotics. And putting them in places when we shouldn't. Same thing occurs for this organism that is actually quite ubiquitous. It's actually on your skin most likely right now, Staph aureus. Viral evolution is a big deal. We have been picking up on that one from COVID-19 and how we can start jumping species. We're also starting to have a worry about the avian flu and how it's starting to potentially harbor itself in mammals. And once it does that, we're on the mammals list, so this isn't good. Invasive species are starting to change. So that would be an example of like that cane toad in Australia. And it's taking out native species. Climate change is actually starting to affect plants, except that the plants aren't necessarily keeping up, so that's bad. If you get cancer, cancers actually have the ability to evolve, and you can have cancers that don't react to your anti-cancer medication, so you're giving it, you know, you have chemotherapy going on and it's not helping. That's because the cancers have evolved to avoid the treatments. So we have to worry a lot in science, and we shouldn't have to, but we do, about how words are utilized. So we have to remember that in science, the word theory is a big deal because the normal speech version of theory is not what we mean in science. So saying something is, quote, just a theory is a big deal in the scientific world. It's not a big deal in the mod you know, in your everyday to day life that has nothing to do with science. But if you're speaking science, theory holds a lot of weight. The theory of evolution has changed multiple times. Ha 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 ha. Insert joke here. That's because... All of science is subject to change, especially when new evidence comes to light. We don't throw stuff out and say, ha ha, it's wrong. We say, how can we improve this? Unless you can't, in which case, okay, yeah, then you have to hit delete because it's incompatible. But every time we look for something with evolution, it seems to keep holding, and then we just need to tinker with some of the edges. So it's constantly being checked. Also remember that religious questions and scientific questions are distinct. So the question of why and the question of how are different. And it's sometimes just better to leave them separate from each other. So next time we're going to look at what goes on in populations and why that matters with evolution.